the presentation, uh, my topic will be defining the spectrum of uh, story systems, exploring new model for understanding emergence of uh, religions, quasi-religions, ideologies, and the cult groups. Uh, in my opinion, uh, this new group, this webinar uh, held by uh, Dr. Sala, uh, that we uh, uh, attended. It's kind of a, like a, a story system group. Uh, that's my uh, impression. Uh, first is my observation of this three hours uh, webinar at the data level. First thing I noticed is Dr. Sola's eyes. He was dazing, dull and straight staring at the screen, staring at the camera, instead of like, a, well, normal presentation, like just a, a, a Fred just did. He, he talks, he smiles, and he, uh, uh, well, talk like a, a Joe Biden or talk like a, a Donald Trump, or, <laughs> whoever doing a regular presentation. I noticed that Dr. Sala is kind of a, oh, looking people like that, looking the screen like that. So that's the, my first observation. And then the Zoom chat box, you know, you, everybody, you, you can see we have a chat box function that's by default. Uh, um, that every seminar people can talk with each other. Uh, and uh, in that chat box, you can always click the little icon and to save the content. And I noticed that they disabled that. That means I cannot make a record on whatever is being exchanged in a chat box. Uh, that is an interesting uh, symbol. And the moderator, I asked the question and the moderator of the chat box lied to me. He said, well, it's Zoom's fault that we cannot do that, which is not true. Every Zoom operator knows there is an option there. They can elect to turn it off. So I kept asking, why do you turn this off? Because I want to analyze people's talk here. Okay, no result. And also they blocked the direct message. For example, here now, if I send a direct message to Mano or to, to Jamie, I can click their name and, uh, and we can do a private message exchange without disturbing the whole group. But uh, they blocked that uh, also. Uh, while I was keep asking questions in the chat box, uh, chat box, a participant called me emotional. They say, oh, Jason, it, it's emotional today. So I was very strange. I, uh, you see, I'm, I'm trying to be humorous, but I'm not uh, emotional at all. And another saying that uh, uh, Jason was not getting the Tao of today. Okay. So these are all the collection observations I noticed in, during that seminar. And I had three basic questions, uh, much less than Fred's 12. My three questions are, are very simple. Does ET exist? I need hard evidence. Question number two is, is easy, uh, has ET come over here already? And, and that question leads to how far they came from, how long it will take, uh, it took their trip, uh, and even why are they here? Uh, the third question is uh, based on previous uh, Fred's um, uh, email exchanges, like, uh, uh, the ETs has white hat guys and black hat guys and white and black hat guys uh, working with the bad forces on earth and white 
white hat guys sort of working with uh, good forces of uh, of the. So I I post the three questions uh, into the both chat box, and then they have a question and the answer channel opened there. I also posted it there, but the organizer ignored or censored the three questions. They never mentioned <laughs> somebody called Jason raised this question. Instead, they have some detail-oriented questions being addressed by the speaker. Uh, so, so these are the facts I encountered. Uh, and they kept talking about the story. This started from talking about the Noah's Ark. Uh, and, and they claimed that the Noah's Ark was actually an E.T. Ark. Uh, and, and I had one comment that all imaginary fantasies, uh, basically uh, throughout the whole three hours. Uh, and they used a large number of quotations, citations from fictions. Uh, and the, the, in my opinion, the number of those quotations won't turn fantasy into reality. And they also use Pentagon's name, uh, CIA names, and they, they say the CIA did this, Pentagon did that. But uh, none of those quotes uh, has direct confirmation source. So I don't see any validity there, uh, using Jamie's word from a philosophy of science of point of view, uh, we don't see the, the truthfulness or validity or reliability of all this information. So uh, second level of uh, focus conversation is about uh, what happened in my mind my feeling and my association triggered by this event. The first thing I noticed, uh, I, I associated, is its similarity to several cult groups that I visited or I exploded. The first one comes into mind is this thing called the Ramsan School of Enlightenment run by a woman named J.Z. Knight. Uh, the picture in the, in, in, is their school that uh, we've, I visited there and I had interviews with them uh, somewhere close to Seattle. Uh, and this is a Google image. If you Google runs a school of alignment, you will get their whole story. And I'm also familiar with some Chinese Qigong groups, uh, i.e. meditation makes wonders to your health and uh, bring, bring up magic effects, things like that. Uh, the commonality of these groups, it, it, we have several uh, of those characteristics. First one is no critical thinking is allowed in a group. And no in-depth discussion. And frequently you heard that the master said so. And that will be the source of validity of them. Uh, so people coming into such groups, they come in with a blind belief already and they came out with an enhanced belief. This phenomenon is what interests me uh, from a cybernetics perspective. So third level, my analysis. Analysis of the previous two levels. First, the narrative consists of a story system. It's a, the concept of a story system uh, I have been working on recently. Story system is a set of stories that support each other among themselves in hearsay format. Well, he said, she said, I heard somebody said 
or in that kind of a format with limited or even zero validity. Here, uh, we can use a relative number to indicate how valid a, a story is. When the valid equals one, that we probably call it science. When validity equals zero, we probably call it a fantasy. So a, system, a story system is a powerful story which has three, at least three functions. First one is it provide entertainment. It's fun, of course. <laughs> uh, it's fascinating, okay. Uh, people can enjoy it a lot. The second one is it offers explanation. Well, it offers not a scientific explanation, but it offers a believable explanation. You can offer your children an explanation about a Santa Claus or unicorn or, uh, or sleeping beauty, that sort of a fairy tale. The third one is to organize people. Okay, that's the powerful part. The, a story system can organize people into action-oriented group. And that, that is what happened in our world that we can observe every day. Since validity is less than one, the missing validity is always filled with so-called belief. Okay, you must believe. And if you believe it, it will be true. This is a phenomenon related to groupthink concept in behavior science, uh, group dynamics, uh, behavior psychology. And also in cybernetics, the Paskian concept of P individual. You know, uh, Gordon Pask separated all concept of individual into P individual, psychological individual, and the main individual, mechanical individual. And he, he had an in-depth discussion about the relationship of these two individual entities. So, so a little bit of review uh, is the um, Benbridge and Stock in 1979. They- Jason, yes? could I ask, I do not understand why it is a P individual, uh, group think so what what does the individual uh, no no those two things are from two, two different uh, direction uh, group think is focused is studied by behavioral scientists uh, it's it's like the whole group uh, blindly uh, coordinated into the same idea which was not their in own intention but uh, somehow they it, it's like a synergy uh, of their conscience that, that they somehow happen to go there. But a uh, ping individual, you know, ping individual, right? Uh, Jamie, uh, uh, the screen, I mean, the, the Jamie on the screen that we see is your main individual because it's your body, it's a biological body of Jamie. So it's just a one. Uh, machine-like, uh, mechanical. Uh, you, you muted, you muted. Your microphone, microphone. Sorry. Yeah. All right, I, I'm going to let it rest, but I just want to say since I'm not a machine, since a machine uh, is... Uh, I think uh, I am means, uh, he, he used am to say a uh, mechanical. It's, it's just this biological thing. But uh, the point, Pascal's point is that uh, within the one um, main individual, within one main individual, you can have multiple P individuals. Okay, you got it. Yes, yeah. Okay, yeah. so review, uh, come back to the screen. Uh, this Bainbridge and Stock research, they studied uh, three different models 
uh, of how these religious ideas are generated and made social. Three ideas. First one is psychopathology model. Second one is entrepreneur model. And third one is a subcultural evolution model. And uh, in 1979, they summarized this first three model and they pointed out that these are models are all useful because they can all explain this phenomenon just uh, we are discussing. And uh, they have two key concepts in there the, 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 they call compensators in the social exchange. So, so, uh, so you, can, you can check out that later. But uh, my purpose of this talk is to push out a better model maybe perhaps mm, before their 1979 one. Story system. Story system carries all three models, group psyche, uh, entrepreneur, and the subcultural evolution. Uh, uh, my uh, habit is to always try to apply my 4DST framework, four dimensional system thinking. Uh, and I have a structural dimension, and procedural dimension, and the cultural dimension to view the same phenomena or same complex system. And also the time dimension uh, will decompose the evolvement or origination and the evolution of the subject being, uh, being, uh, being observed. So, so on a structural dimension, it, it is a story role setup. So in each of this story system, you have a limited number of roles. Uh, you, you, you have good guys, bad guys, uh, you have problematic guys, you have troublemakers. Uh, anyway, you have a whole group of, so that was your setting. And uh, the procedural dimension, you have the, uh, a chain of events. You have the unfolding of, of the whole drama. Uh, you have timeline and the causality chain. And uh, there is cultural dimension uh, focusing on the value systems hidden in the story uh, and uh, the morals. And uh, on the time dimension, uh, you can notice that uh, the same story might, might uh, mutate itself and different versions coming out from very early uh, simple ideas. Uh, examples, the biggest example is the Bible story. Uh, I do not know uh, your guys' uh, religious stand up uh, 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 standing point, but uh, but uh, to me, Bible the Bible is a very fascinating, a very powerful story system that helps the human evolution for a long time, at least twenty two thousand years, uh, and uh, all the Hollywood stories, especially those. Uh, multiple session sequel stories like uh, the Lord of Rings, like uh, the Matrix, like uh, Terminator, uh, anyone, uh, any of those stories having powerful influence are good examples of what I'm talking about here. All the Disney stories, of course, for children for younger age and uh, and we also have a specific stories for nations. Each nation, uh, they have their own story system. Well, like Russia had Russian story system, and, uh, Ukraine has Ukraine's story system, etc. And uh, the term history is actually high story. <laughs> story has a higher status in, in my view. And in the facilitation, facilitator world, they have a methodology called the War of Wonder. Uh, 
they use that uh, uh, technology to uh, to re-emphasize the self-identity of the organization. So the so-called War of Wonder is a collective brainstorming session that uh, share the memories uh, of the members uh, for this organization. And that's also some uh, example of the, such a story system. So story system can be very small, uh, small to a husband or wife, a family setting, but it can be very big uh, to the whole Christianity uh, civilization like the Bible. Uh, and the stories can range from non-fictions to fictions and anything in between. Uh, so the example, if in the case of religions, then we can say that faith equals one, validity equals zero. Because the, the story was all made up. And in a science situation, faith equals zero because everybody is just talking about a hypothesis and the subject to testing uh, either falsification or, 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 or uh, confirmation. But uh, science target at gaining its validity to one. So that's the definition. And we can measure these story systems. And, uh, and therefore, if we can achieve the actual measurement, we can have a spectrum. Uh, and the measurement at least, I think, including the first one is the richness or complexity. Uh, in, in, in words of uh, total number of roles, and uh, each role has its sub-story to each role. So, so we can start this from uh, all the Greek mythologies and the Nordic mythologies and the Eastern Asian mythologies. And, and uh, all this, you can observe them as like a little species like, uh, of, grouping people together with their right richness and complexity. Uh, if it's too simple, people abandon them. If it's too complicated, people won't, won't digest. But uh, just the right appropriate zone of complexity story will catch up. And, this, and the second measurement would be uh, it's a structure of uh, a psychological gaston. It, it's, it's like uh, you compare different uh, regions um, of uh, culture, you will notice that, that there that there is something in common, like uh, like good and evil, uh, and bright versus dark, uh, and uh, troublemakers. Uh, uh, anthropy increases. Uh, I forgot to mention India here. Uh, third one, they have a strong explanatory power because people have curiosity, people have questions, especially children have questions. They need answers. Not everyone can learn as much as uh, Stephen Hawking uh, or, or Albert Einstein. So they need the simple answers. And the story system offers those simple answers. Uh, so I call it attractiveness R uh, on the rationality part. This include conspiracy theories because uh, a lot of people look down upon or, or, or hate conspiracies. But uh, I pay attention to them simply because they offer explanations to many people. And the next one will be its comfort or hope supply function. So a, a good story can bring a lot of comfort to people who, who are suffering from something. Uh, so how much stress, how much fear and pain can be removed by your story system? 
that is another measurement. Uh, but finally, and maybe not the last one, but the, the most important one I pay attention to is the organizational power or converging power of such story systems. It's capacity of forming an action-oriented social group, a political party uh, with added resource. Uh, for example, we talked about a lot about the CCP, Chinese Communist Party, and they all, it all starts from a story. The story comes from Russian, uh, at this time USSR, and the funding from USSR as well. Uh, 20, uh, 21 people meeting together, believing in the same story and created their history. So story systems and the group they form are species of civilization evolution. So the que interesting question is, what kind of a story fits the needs of what kind of people according to Bear Curve 2.0? And the science or system science on one extreme of the spectrum because any non-valid heresies are not accepted. On the other extreme, religions, the spiritual group, uh, they have they have somehow established non-questionable beliefs uh, as a prerequisite. So everything else must be in between of these two. Uh, uh, two extremes with different measures in complexity, explanation power, uh, comforting resource and organizational power. So my last final, uh, my final slide, I think it's the last one, yeah. It's maybe minor would be interested is I'll try to make a comparison between the biological evolution and the civilization evolution. Uh, biological evolution is the change in heritable characteristics. In civilization evolution side, it's the change in identifiable characteristics, same, similar. And of biological populations in environmental context and the the right side is of cultural groups in geopolitical context formed and organized by their specific story system. So for the left side, uh, such uh, the evolution as a result of genetic variation is the main role. And on the right side, is a result of a cultural gene group and their story system change. Uh, I have example of Japan after World War II, Germany after World War II, and the Taiwan, and there are many other examples. Once you replaced the story system about yourselves and about a human history, about how you organize each other uh, or organize together, then the evolution moves forward or change. So, so the left side, you have natural selection, including sexual selection, and the criteria will be the survival of the fittest. On the right side, you have a cultural conflict including merger of cultures, cultural genes, leading to, again, survival of the fittest. And this fittest concept, including domestication, changing people into domestic animals. Uh, we observed some of those phenomena also in our real world. 
So the left side, the, the biological evolution responding to evolutionary pressure from the change of the nature environment. And uh, in the case of a civilization evolution, it's re responding to peer pressure, opponent pressure, the rival pressure from across geometry interactions of different groups. So the last to uh, compare is, well, the result of such evolution, biologically it's judged or fated by its fitness with its ecological niche. And uh, it's the species positioning in the food chain. And uh, the right side, the civilization, uh, the ideas can, can be judged or fated by the group's capacity to correct its unfitness with the mainstream value system, whatever the mainstream value system might be. So that's my presentation. <laughs> no, terrific. Thanks a lot. Please, questions. <laughs> All right. Um, sorry, Manel, go first, please. Oh, no, you go first. Are you sure? Are you sure? Yeah. Okay, yes. Jason, very quickly, in your email exchange with Fred, I heard you, or I thought I read that you said you had the UFO experience yourself. Yes, I had one. Uh, you had one. So, so you're just... Uh, commenting on this Dr. Salah and his presentation, but not really on the UFO experience itself. Is that correct? Uh, you, you actually already um, mentioned the philosophy of science uh, setting of how we think uh, of unexplainable phenomena observed uh, and establish of a facts, there is a long distance. I think this group just uh, fly over, <laughs> jump. They didn't, they didn't draw clear distinction between what unexplainable. For example, I saw the video footages of uh, US Air Force. It is something there, but that's something Okay, number one, is this video uh, reliable? Is this video, are this video faked? I can tell you on, a, on my only experience that it was in a, during a conference of my, in my working unit. Uh, it was in Dalian. Uh, we, we four people sleeping in the same uh, dormitory, we were chatting on our bed and the, and the my direction was my head was facing the window and uh, why why it was uh, early night not very late and i saw my with my own eyes uh, a light bulb not an airplane not a uh, uh, not to my knowledge is anything I know, but not the bull shaped uh, flash, but a, a very clear bull like thing. And not too bright and not, not too dark, flying quietly over the window like there. So I shot to the address to the, to the other people in the dormitory. Say, look outside of the window. What's that? Because first number one, it could be an airplane. But in that height, we should listen. We we, we should hear the airplane noise. Uh, it should be very loud. No voice. No voice. And I I was not deaf. None of us are deaf. So it's an unexplainable aerodynamic phenomenon. <laughs> it's there. But drawing a conclusion of what it is, so it's a very big 
research project. And uh, Fred just mentioned um, many of such researches involved with the militaries, weaponries, and uh, covert actions and classified, etc. So for our normal people, uh, I have a concept called a self-hiding fact. <laughs> we cannot dig out those, uh, what exactly the fact is. So we, we should not jump to the conclusion like Dr. Sala and his group. And everybody came to this webinar already believed there are ETs and the good ETs and bad ETs. And they went into details to discuss uh, all the futures of the world and things like that. So, so it's typical story system triggered by unexplainable phenomena. Fred? A couple of comments? Yes. Well, first off, I do think it's a valuable contribution what you've done about the story, the, your whole presentation um, I, you know, I would suggest if you haven't already considered it, uh, try to publish that, um, you know, in a, a professional scientific journal. Uh, maybe, I don't know about you. That's co-author it because, because no, my no, English is so bad. I cannot do easy publication. For me, doing a presentation and put it on YouTube is already pub publication because only interest people will follow up. Mm, yeah, that's a good idea if you could help me. <laughs> well, I don't, I'm not recommending you do it on the UFO topic, but I'm re because Sala is a minuscule part of the whole topic. So it's a very in incomplete and potentially misleading, uh, but the framework you're presenting, um, well, I, I you know, you talk, you talk about scientific credibility. The fact of the matter is, regardless of how big YouTube is in videos, it's still the case. The primary currency and the, at least the high end so-called academic research community is published papers. Now they take e-papers, that's okay. But the, the peer review process for better or for worse is still given a lot of a lot of weight and implied credibility so you know from the point of view to me you would benefit by by going that route regardless of what you put on youtube or vimeo or any other you know platform that is my opinion speaking about the academic community uh you know generally and there's and and a lot of weight is given to that once you crack into that um situate you know into that arena that gives opens up more credible doors if you wish on on the video side so anyway that's my number one feedback uh, that to you okay. uh, uh the, my number two feedback is you know it's an interesting analysis of of one webinar of many done by a UFO researcher who is, in my opinion, a serious researcher. He's, been, he's basically doing it full time for 20, 15 years anyway. And, and but, you know, um, he's just one in the cube of UFO work, you know, he's just holding down one second. Uh, the point is the, the amount of the research they have been done uh, can be can be huge, but why not they can answer my three very basic simple question? That that's uh, a big question mark. <laughs> yeah, Jason, I think I, I have to share with you since I was there. Uh huh. Uh, you overfollowed my advice. Uh -huh. I said get questions in early. You were you put it in right at the beginning of the whole thing. And they were voluminous. In other words, they're used to just like a one or two cents type 
question, and I, I'm not. The, maybe maybe they are not wanting to deal with you. I'm not taking a position on that. I'm just saying, <laughs> you put in, you overloaded, you went the other way and overloaded. I overloaded early. that cognitive capacity. No, uh, so no, I don't the think thing is, lead, uh, yeah. Let me add one thing. Uh, the whole process of a chat box, uh, half of those messages are something like, uh, I love you, I love you all, uh, <laughs> good to see you here. <laughs> uh, it's, not, uh, it's not doing research about the topic, but it's like a social gathering that uh, like-minded people are uh, were warming up with each other. <laughs> So, so that was my experience. Well, I hate to say it, Jason. I think you have a slanted view of what happened. And there was a substantial amount of substantive comments on the chat. Yes, there were a variety of personal comments or, or something, you know, but it's not true that there was nothing of value on the chat. Can, can you get a copy of the chat box? I don't have a copy of the chat can you, box. Can you ask them? Since you you are good at the code, uh, head of a code of them, uh, maybe hey, you can it's ask not, them to it's have. Not worth talk. pursuing, Jason. It's not worth pursuing. It was just okay, you know, not worth pursuing. No, I'm not going to do that. It's not worth it. It's a distraction, and and there you're overreacting and misreading what happened. At least as far I'm as I'm just too critical. <laughs> critical. Sorry, I don't agree with you, Jason. I don't agree with what you extrapolated from that from that webinar okay. that I was on and I saw I read the entire chat box as it was happening. And um, the reason they didn't answer your question is because it was too complicated. And maybe they forgot it because it was too early. <laughs> but I'm just saying you can believe whatever you want to believe about the webinar. I'm just giving you my opinion. And it's a different opinion. But you know, I thought your presentation on the story thing was wonderful. Hmm. Okay. Just, sure. The good news <laughs> is I thought your overall presentation was wonderful and you need to do something with it. Assuming this is new ground, assuming what you're saying, I'm not familiar with the literature in that area, but I would strongly recommend that you take that and get it into a, reckon, a reputable journal or submit it maybe a yeah. social psychology journal organization we will listen to we we'll listen to Manu. he's an expert on this <laughs> say what i'm not an expert but i i will try to give you a couple of comments also mm -hmm. um i i thought that it was very interesting the the fact that you uh, compared two extremes religion and and science and in between everything else that i i, I was thinking where does philosophy fit this classification but i also thought that it was interesting the fact that you were assuming that there was truth behind the stories so some stories have a higher degree of truth than others and you assume that ideology was somehow in between who have 50 percent probability of being right and 50 percent of being wrong i would say that philosophy has also the aim of being right or uh, and and sometimes it's wrong most of the times but there's also something similar to, to science in philosophy. And, and also, I, I also thought that was what was interesting about your comparison between biological evolution and civilization is that you try to compare would be, what would be the equivalent. But also, I, I see a lot of uh, ideology um, in, in, in terms of what ways and conforming to what the masses think and all that. But it would be interesting also to add that uh, degree of uh, truthfulness. How would that affect that evolution? Because I, I also think that we're also evolving. And if, if we are believing science, we, we should also improve that evolution. I don't know whether we, we are there. Maybe we are evolving in terms of technologically speaking and in terms of values and in terms of policies and all that. We are behind in, in a lot of things so i don't know how because when when i think about humanity i think we are somehow in progress in four spheres in terms of art in terms of uh i would say plenty which would be the economy in terms of uh legal the, the concept of right or wrong and that's why we have laws but also in 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 the sense of 
I don't know whether whether I said it of value. So there's basically four or ethics, four different spheres in which there's some progress. And that also takes me back to, to truth, because I don't think that some, something that's truly one of those four things is, is, is not truthful. So somehow behind those stories, I, I would like you to expand more on the concept of truth, because I think that's what lies behind what you are trying to say. That's only a couple of comments that I thought would be interesting. Okay, let's exchange emails <laughs> for more details. Uh, this is a work in progress, a work in progress. So it's uh, it, it's not final yet. Jamie. Mm. Yes. So um, I I would like to follow up what uh, Manel is telling, um, and and also uh, uh, Fred. So so the. I'm actually also working on uh, writing about storytelling as kind of the the foundational paradigm in which we can make sense of everything. But I had a feeling a little bit that you weren't really telling stories; you were classifying also. And and here I'm making a reference to the work of Stephen Pepper. And I don't know whether any of you are familiar with it. It's published in 1942. And he, uh, he actually, he, the title is World Hypothesis. And so each world hypothesis is a manner of telling stories. And what Pepper says is we, we need to switch among all four. So we cannot just stick in one. We, we need to really do an effort to, to, uh, to make sure that whatever we say is consistent with all four. And so, uh, number one is formism, he calls it. As a footnote, the challenge of reading papers, it needs to be translated in contemporary language. But uh, formism is the classifying. So everything needs to be classified here or there or wherever. Now, number two is mechanism. And that's a story that looks at causality, that is cause and effect. And it's usually the, a, a machine, a mechanical machine. And, and now today we have an electronic machine with the computational computers, literally. But number four is- uh, Three, where's the three? I, I, I should say number three. Number three is what is called contextualism. Um, and that is actually a gestalt switching because the contextualism is always saying there's a background and a foreground. And so we need to be, whatever we say, we need to be aware that, that we're always working with the background and the foreground. And then number four is organicism and that is like puzzling. So just you want to have the whole picture and then you look at, all the pieces of the puzzle and whether they all fit together and so whether the story is coherent. And um, so what I heard you, uh, okay, I couldn't resist, but I, I felt you didn't acknowledge enough that there is a problem that they're trying to solve. And, and I think that was what Fred was trying to say. So the problem is this phenomena that are totally unexplainable. And so, um, and so does that, and does that uh, Dr. Sala is acting as some strange person because he has literally had the experience of being rejected by the academy and, and he just is maybe looking for normal people to interact with, but the only ones who show up are the cult followers. <laughs> so he's looking maybe for a good philosopher to help him. Uh, but 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 he didn't recognize that you were trying to help him because of the the fact that your questions that the moderator didn't understand your questions so he kind of the moderator became a screen who prevented you from actually developing a relation with dr sala so so that is all that i'm trying to say that uh when i look at that contextualism hypothesis the foreground background i, I didn't see you acknowledging the possibility that there was a genuine, or maybe you did, but, but it didn't come out clear enough, that, that there was a genuine problem and, and that there is a huge challenge 
in articulating it because people are so afraid today to think outside the box for no clear reason they are afraid and and so you didn't acknowledge that in your story. Does that uh, it's because uh, it's so short a presentation, you cannot yeah. co cover that conversation. But you are right. Uh, any story system emerge in order to respond to yeah. a challenge or a, a problem. So, so, so that was uh, uh, Tom B. Tongbi's theme of uh, challenge yeah. and the response. Uh, of course, uh, people need this. <laughs> when, they, when they fear already something unexplainable or some risk, uh, well, January 6th is a response to a challenge, right? So, uh, and uh, Putin is response to a challenge, to making a war. So, so, so the circular, <laughs> you don't like that term, circular causality. It's, no. <laughs> it's always there. The chain of reaction is always going on. So I if, agree if with I, If I may respond to the circular causality, I don't see the circular causality. I actually see from Stephen Pepper's uh, reading, I see the metaphor of mechanism that is pushed down the throat from people so there's nothing circular to what they respond uh, or, or to the causality of the process is, is very clearly identifiable they're all told to be obedient machines i mean mechanistic so the computational theory of the mind was being taught in psychology departments and i don't know manuel I think I know which country you're from, but I'm not 100% sure. So I don't know how they teach it in your country. But, he... but uh, can, can you share this paper that you mentioned to, to us? The, uh, the Stephen Pepper one? Uh, yeah, the four. The, the four. Yeah, yeah. Um, I will on the, on the mailing list. But so the computational theory of the mind is setting up people as machines that need to be obedient. And so a successful mm -hmm. machine is obedient. Mm -hmm. And so people are sick and tired of being treated as machines. And, and that is what the reaction is. And they're also not trusting the academy anymore because the, the machine theory is coming from the, the academy. And, and so there is this they're lost and so um so i don't see anything circular i see a very clear causality that it comes from an academy that's not doing its job of acknowledging that we work with metaphors because that is unfortunate i mean that's not unfortunate that is the reality we we are using stories or full of metaphors to talk about the, the unknown, the unobservable, the unexplainable that we're trying to kind of put the finger on without really knowing how to. And so we need a course that tells us how we work with metaphors and psychology departments do the opposite. They say, no, that's a taboo topic and you're all machines and you're going to listen. And if you don't, then you're against science and now we can discard you as some deplorable that we don't need to listen to. So yeah, you, you're of... talking about uh, the big story from the big brother, top yeah. down, and that that was the one, one thing. Uh, I'm paying attention more to the self-organized and the self-emergent uh, stories from grassroots. And some of the story, they just uh, die off. But uh, some of them, uh, become bigger and bigger, stronger and stronger, uh, like this UFO uh, group. And uh, they can collect uh, $33 per listener. So if, if that seminar was, say, 1,000 people there, then <laughs> it's good, handsome money <laughs> to share. Uh, so it's an entrepreneur model. Yeah. Oh, okay, so that is the what we are putting is that paper there? It's a book, uh, Oral oh, okay. Hypothesis. Okay, thank you. Mm.
Any more questions? Okay, I, I just then as a footnote, I, I just gave that example of the machine metaphor as as a as a uh, in response to what you said about circular causality, uh, that I think we we need to look at how people work with metaphors and that. that uh, are you are you familiar? Are you aware of uh, the movie Mind Walk? Is that uh, the one? Uh, uh, Opera. Said... Yeah, I, I, I we translate that into Chinese. Is that uh, the one a... uh, uh, of the Mont Saint Michel? Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. I, I watched. So the it. machine metaphor was fully debunked in that. Yeah, movie. that okay, Jason. But that's the interesting thing now. At the time the movie was made, the metaphor was being debunked. But then the pendulum swung in the other direction. <laughs> really? <laughs> now, it's it's very popular again. I mean, you, you would be amazed how popular. Uh, but, but... You can invite Capra to have a talk with us. Uh, he's still alive and he, he has communication with Stuart recently. Uh, I, I I met him at the a dedication to uh, Maturana or Varela. I don't remember the one who died recently. I, I was because you mentioned that the, the, the pendulum is shrink back, so we should get him <laughs> to do something. Yeah, but actually, I, I think I personally think that that um, was in the problem solving frame. Does mm -hmm. that Capra said there is this problem and we need to work on it, and that literally it kind of crawls. So, so people never did the next step to work on it. So, so when I use the pendulum, I'm kind of um, I'm not talking about. Uh, actually, I'm I'm talking about. Yeah, I'm. Uh, I I don't mean Capra, but I I just mean. The, the academy in the 1970s and 80s, they were talking about metaphors and everyone was publishing about metaphors. And then in 95 or something with the with the internet uh, and, and computer technology really becoming more popular, then they dropped the topic of metaphors and, and they started, actually no, they started, it's, it's worse even, they started talking about the mind as a machine that produces metaphors. And and I would love with Capra to talk about it. So they say we're talking about metaphors, but, but they say the mind is a machine producing metaphors. So, so they kind of make the topic impossible to discuss because they use a, a metaphor to justify that everyone is using metaphors, but but they should be able to discuss: is this really the best metaphor? And and can I you, don't know. Can 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 you do a summary session of what you're just talking about? And we'll invite Capra over, and perhaps people in the machine metaphors rank, and people in anti machine rank. We we have a lot of members uh, uh, on that rank. Well, we we can have an interesting session if you could do the lead. I would love that, and I'll, I'll be in touch. With okay, you. give me give me a time, day, day. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so let's do that. Yeah.